Thank you very much. Um, that was fascinating. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I'd like to call on our final keynote speaker of the day. Um, and I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Louise Wood, um, who's Director of Science, Research and Evidence for the Department of Health and Social Care. And again, in, in terms of um, maximising our time, um, Louise uh, has, has agreed for me not to read out her whole bio. So welcome. Come on up. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for the warm welcome. It's been a fascinating day uh, so far. Great to uh, meet some old colleagues, as well as to hear about the innovation that's happening locally. So I'm going to talk um, about clinical research, but I'm going to actually speak a bit broader than that, because NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, is about more than clinical research. And I think the opportunities that we've heard about uh, today are much broader than clinical research. So I want to speak to some of those topics as well. So for those of you who've not come across NIHR before, we are a major research funder. We've got an annual budget of uh, over a billion pounds a year. We're funded through the Department of Health and Social Care, so separate from UK research and innovation, but we work very closely with them. And this slide shows the key activities that NHR supports. So we fund high quality research to benefit the NHS, public health and social care. We fund, uh, staff to delivery staff to support translation of basic science into new products and services. We put great emphasis on involving patients, the public and service users at all stages of the research journey. And it's been fantastic to, to see and meet a few uh, representatives of patient organizations in, in the room uh, today. We uh, provide uh, um, infrastructure to support research funded by life sciences companies, by colleagues in other government departments, and by medical research charities. We work closely across the ecosystem to try and ensure that we've got a cohesive ecosystem, and we also support global health research, but I'm not gonna major on that today. So Andrew has very much set the scene in terms of research during COVID. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that because I think it helps showcase uh, some of the contributions that this region has made that have influenced uh, policy and practice globally. So NIHR working in partnership with the Medical Research Council funded a lot of research on uh, therapeutics and on prophylaxis. So, Andrew's talked about the recovery trial and the principal trial, the remap cap trial. So these were about trying to identify new therapeutics to help people who had been hospitalized or before they got to, to hospital. Andrew talked about the results of the recovery trial. We had more than 173 trusts throughout the country supporting that trial. But one incredible stat that you might not be familiar with was that 17% of the participants for the recovery trial in the year 2020-21 came from this region. That's fantastic. And that was because of local leadership and collaboration. And I'll come back to that theme later. Uh, we funded a lot of uh, research on vaccines, so that included the uh, Imperial and the Oxford AstraZeneca, before it was AZ uh, uh, vaccine. We've looked at uh, combinations of vaccines, combinations of uh, the COVID vaccines with the flu uh, vaccine. And we've also delivered a large number of vaccine trials, including recruiting the first patient globally for Janssen and Novavax studies. Epidemiology. We funded a lot of research to look at the impact of the pandemic on mental ill health, to uh, ascertain or seek to ascertain a better understanding of the uh, differential impact on people from black and minority ethnic communities. Um, Camlish Kunti 
and colleagues have played a major role in that, both in terms of understanding the impact on patients and the public, but also on healthcare professionals. And then a huge amount of work supporting sequencing. Uh, and again, big role for the region. You've seen the map that Andrew's uh, presented. The genomics hubs played a major role there. We've been active on the international stage supporting global health research, including the uh, Warwick Global Health Research Unit funded by NIHR. Testing and diagnostics, the Condor Platform Trial, but also the work that was done uh, by Tom Clotten Brook and uh, colleagues at the Trauma NIHR MedTech and Invitro collaboration in Birmingham looking at testing of ventilators, CPAP, and non-invasive -invent non ventilation. Long COVID, major problem. One of the first studies we uh, funded, the FOSP study, headed up by uh, Professor Chris Breitling in Leicester, and then further long COVID studies being supported and in some cases led by colleagues in this region. And then last but not least, work to support uh, um, the SAGE committee that was providing scientific advice to government. So a huge amount of support and leadership from this region that is influencing international practice. Now, the NIHR funds a clinical research network which provides full geographical coverage. It supports, uh, probably from phase two to later stage research, supports the delivery of those clinical studies and clinical investigations. So this slide shows uh, data from uh, financial year 1415 to 2021. So in general, we'd see over 1,500 studies being supported in the Midlands region, with about 200 new studies being started every year, led by this region. And in the last seven years, an average of over 129,000 people from across this region participating in studies. That's important for health outcomes, but it's also great because it saves the NHS money, it generates revenues for the NHS, and also it's generating jobs in, in the region. We also fund centres of excellence in early translational research between leading trust university partnerships, our biomedical research centres, designated as a result of an international panel which makes recommendations to the Department of Health and Social Care. We also have uh, infrastructure designed specifically to support the med tech industry, our mix. I'm not going to go into the detail of those now. And actually, you don't need to know the acronym SOUP. We fund people to support you to navigate your way, a, a concierge service to help you find the right people with the right expertise and the right kit to help you develop and deliver uh, your studies. One of the things that came up earlier is how can we get more money into this, uh, this region? Well, one way is to be developing the researchers of the future who are going to be applying for funding. So let's meet a few of the people in this, in this region supported by NIHR. So this is uh, Dr. Sam uh, Mellins. He's a clinical psychologist. Once he'd qualified, he got a job working uh, to support uh, cognitive behavioural therapy in uh, Leicester hospitals and working in the East Midlands NHR Applied Research Collaboration. He's now being supported on a three-year fellowship funded by NHR and Health Education England. Here we've got Dr. Damien Rowland. So he's uh, an NIHR doctoral fellow and honorary assistant professor in Leicester hospitals in emergency medicine. So his research career started with an NIHR academic fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine. And his doctoral research has been looking at a framework to evaluate e-learning interventions. 
And then thirdly, meet Amanda Daly. So Amanda is Professor of Behavioural Medicine at the School of Sports, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. She's an NIHR professor and her professorship is looking at lifestyle interventions to help the public become more active and ultimately to help uh, address and prevent obesity. So that's a bit about what's happening locally. Let's zoom out again to, to the national stage. Now, earlier this year, in July, my colleagues in the Office for Life Sciences published the Vision for Life Sciences, which recognised it built on the Life Sciences Industrial Strategy, but recognised that the environment has changed since COVID and since Brexit. And it identified three key policy areas that need to be pursued by government if we are to achieve our ambition to continue to be a leader in life sciences research, but actually to grow that. And that related to building on our fantastic basic science and establishing, further establishing ourselves to test things at scale across the country. Ensuring that the NHS is a partner for innovation. And this has been, this has been an ongoing challenge for, for a number of years. And we, we touched a bit about that in the discussion this, this morning. And then ensuring that we've got the right uh, business uh, environment. It highlights how important genomics and data science are as underpinners to this agenda. And again, this region has got that in spades. And Andrew talked through some of the examples of the assets that you have in this region. Before the pandemic, the UK was a leading place for research, second only to the US and China for early phase clinical research, slightly less, com less competitive for late phase research. But we were really up there. But we've got to recognise that the pandemic created a lot of collateral damage for non-COVID research. We had a magnificent research response to COVID, but the NHS pivoted to support the response to COVID, and that has had collateral damage on our research in other therapeutic areas. And I've, I've, I wish I had a, a, a tenor for every time I've heard someone say, we should never let a crisis go to waste. And it's often attributed to, to William uh, to, uh, Churchill, that actually, if you go back to Machiavelli, it's very much a theme that was in, in, the, in the Prince. And there is a lot that we can actually learn from the COVID experience not least that can-do attitude, that real focus on a risk-based approach on cutting through bureaucracy which did not add. And we're determined that we really build on that experience and learn from it. And in March of this year, UK governments and the devolved administrations launched a, a bold and ambitious vision for the future of UK clinical research delivery with an action plan for the financial year that we're in published in, in July. Those are public domain documents. And what they really focus on is how we essentially restore the research portfolio in non-COVID areas, how we build back a better and more resilient clinical research system learning from the, as I said, the more risk-based uh, regulation, learning from our ability to uh, use remote monitoring, using more um, virtual trials, etc. So many things that we can adopt for the, for the future. And then really ensuring that we use those to uh, promote our capabilities and capacity in terms of being a life sciences uh, hub for clinical research. We've got a programme board which brings together delivery partners uh, in the NHS, in the regulators, with uh, our advisory group co-chaired by the ABPI representing industry as a whole and um, the Association of Medical Research Charities. 
And, and we don't, you know, we didn't start from scratch. There have been a series of reports over recent years, including from Cancer Research UK, the Royal College of Physicians, and Johnson talked about the Academy of Medical Sciences report. There is remarkable consensus about what we need to do to really harness the capability and capacity of this nation to be a leader in, in clinical research. And this slide summarizes the key themes and areas of focus that we're looking to take, take forward. So firstly, how we make sure that clinical research is embedded in the NHS, that it's not seen as something that, you know, pointy heads doing a lab down the corridor. It's something that everyone in the NHS sees as part of their job, whether it's about being research aware, research facilitative, or research leader. And that was one reason why Leicester and the, the rest of this region did so well in recruiting to COVID, because you absolutely ensured that delivery of that trial was embedded in acute emergency medicine. So much to learn from that. Next, how do we make research more, more patient-centered? So how do we make sure that the research is conducted where patients are, be they living in rural areas or inner cities? How do we make sure that research reflects the full population, not just people who happen to live around centres of excellence, not just people who happen to have time to engage with the research system, but those communities that have often been overlooked because we've not made enough effort to reach through to them to engage them in research and what it has to offer them and their, and their, their colleagues. Um, how do we streamline and make research more efficient and innovative? Lots of new opportunities to design trials. We've got regulators who are really pro-innovation, who are there to support with trial design, along with clinical trial units. And again, you have those in this, in this region. We need to use our digital infrastructure better to support more efficient studies. And, and Andrew's uh, articulated some examples of how that worked really well during the, the pandemic. And then last but not least, we have to look at how we uh, create and establish a sustainable workforce. That might be around diversifying the research workforce, supporting uh, clinical research, but it's also about making sure that there are career structures around to enable not just medics, but others to develop a research career, not have to choose between uh, being uh, in, involved in care or, or research. I'm going to zoom out again a bit now and just talk about NIHR's uh, areas of focus. So we were established in uh, 2006 under Best Research for Best Health. Earlier this year, we published Best Research for Best Health, the next chapter, which is an articulation of the key areas of strategic priority that we have been pursuing in recent years and are intending to continue to pursue for the next few uh, years. And I'm going to go through these uh, quite, quite quickly. So first is around ensuring that the health and care system has the evidence that it needs to build back, in this government's word, wording, build back better, but building back more resilient systems, building back systems that are going to cater better to the different needs of the diverse communities that this country um, has. Um, preventing ill health, improving public health and social care is is difficult there are, and it's a really really important challenge so we are looking at how we build capability and capacity in this area particularly with local authorities and it's disappointing that we don't have local authorities in the room today and i would urge you to think about how the midlands better engages with your local authorities because so many of the determinants of health 
are outside the health system. And it's the local authorities in education, housing, um, local shopping areas, etc., cetera, who've, who've got so much opportunity to influence this agenda. It's also about how we focus on some of the areas that have been underserved by, by research historically, in, including uh, mental ill health. Next up, we've got 14 million people in England who are living with two or more chronic health conditions. They're not served well by clinical services and they haven't been served well by research. Often they've been, people with uh, multiple long-term conditions have been excluded from research studies. We're gonna help address that, working with other funders. Similarly, people in regions and communities where the burden of uh, ill health is highest have often not had the opportunity to participate in research, and we are working really hard to address that. Next up, we're looking at how we can better embody equality, diversity, and inclusivity in our workforce, in the people who sit on our panels making judgments about what gets funded, in the participants in our research, and in the people who get funded to do research, and in the people we fund to have research careers. Next week, we're gonna be publishing data for the first time on our uh, awardees and our panels and so on. There are some areas which are encouraging, but like other funders, it also shines a light on areas where we really, really need to do better. And I'm really grateful to, to the Leicester Centre for Ethnic Minority Health, which has really uh, supported some of our thinking about what sh we should be doing in this area. Similarly, five of the uh, NHR centres in Birmingham are piloting our race equality framework, which looks to help organisations assess uh, their, their racial competence in uh, health, health research. Next up, we have got groups in the research community that lack recognition and career support. So that includes research delivery staff, nurses, but also clinical research practitioners and so on methodologists, and also allied health professionals. We need to make sure that there are career pathways to support all these people who are vital to a multidisciplinary research endeavor. And then last but not least, we are determined to improve the way that we work with the life sciences industries, big and small. And that's why, you know, being part of events like today is, is so valuable to, to hear directly from you about what's working well and, and what isn't and what we need to do better. So what does all that mean then for the Midlands? You know, I think you're in such a good place, good potential place. More to do, I'd say. So let's look at the themes. Clinical research embedded in the NHS. As I say, this region led the way on the recovery trial because you genuinely worked together, the research community with NHS staff to make sure research was embedded. Patient-centered research. I've talked about the, you, you know, you wanted to know, well, how can we get more, more funding from government? You know, we are absolutely expecting and nudging and requiring the researchers coming to NHR for funding to demonstrate how they have involved uh, underserved communities. And you're, you have areas of, of, of unmet need, as, as, do, as do others. I've mentioned the Centre for Ethnic uh, Minority Research, a great resource there. You've got Mel Calvert, you know, leading international researcher on patient reported outcomes. You've got the, um, the Birmingham Clinical Research Facility bus, which goes out to the regions to try and uh, enable a greater cohort of people to be involved in early phase translational research. We're seeing integrated care systems being created. You've got the uh, 
the director of the School for Primary Care based in Kiel University. So you've got lots of people who are able to support your thinking as a region. You heard from Mike Lewis this morning, based at, Man at Birmingham University, director of the NHR Eye for Eye programme, providing support, financial support, for research for uh, SMEs and others. So you've got lots of local expertise. In terms of streamlining uh, uh, research and using uh, data and digital, Andrew's made the case for what you've got available locally. And you've got all those medical schools. What's the thinking about the curricula for how people are being trained and developed through those medical schools? What about the other schools that you have here to support um, other health professionals who are vital to uh, the research endeavour? Collaboration is critical. Collaboration across your region, and I think Mike Lewis's point this morning about, compete, about collaborating rather than competing is so important. You would be amazed if you, if you sat in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a national funder like I do to see what happens when you just get fractured bids from a region where actually if people had come together they would have been able to mount such a more powerful and compelling uh, bid. It's about collaboration across sectors, NHS, university, industry, and local authorities. You know, I think for the med tech sector, particularly in digital, there's so much opportunity for collaboration there. Could you become a leader uh, in, that, in that area? And ultimately, the competition is not the regions down the road or the regions in the greater southeast. The competition for international business and investment is against other countries. You know, so it's great to collaborate for greater effect. And it's really nice to see uh, the other regional um, hubs here talking about how we can make a better offer across the UK, as well as ensuring that this region makes the most of the assets that it has. In terms of population, you have got a very diverse uh, population. Regulators and payers are looking for evidence of clinical utility as well as efficacy for drugs in the populations in which the drugs are going to be used or the technology is going to be used. What a great test bed, then, we have here. You've got diverse communities in terms of um, um, urban as well as uh, rural communities. Workforce, I've touched on that. Lots of opportunities there around the training that's provided to healthcare professionals of the future here. Tremendous assets in terms of um, your data, your genomics, infrastructure that's funded by NIHR, but also other funders, the expertise in the region. But I go back to that final point is collaboration, collaboration for success. It's so sad when that doesn't happen. I think you've got so much to offer. And if you can only actually make sure that you come together to bring that together, you're going to be in with such a fantastic opportunity. You know, my job with NHR is to make sure that all the things that we're funding across the country add up to more than the sum of the parts. You've got, you're, you've got the same challenge in your region, but you've got the advantage that you can bring people into the same room. I can't do that for the whole country. So collaborate, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I've got a dash soon, but you know, you know where I live. So feel free, feel free to get in touch.
Thank you very much, and, and uh, I, I'm sure that um, there will be other opportunities to um, ask questions and things. Um, so I just want to take us into the uh, last part of our, our day today. And um, firstly, I just want, as we won't be having a closing session together back in this room, to say thank you to um, our keynote speakers and panel members. They have actually been fantastic throughout the day. I also want to thank the session presenters, and we do have some presenters um, who will be getting going in a minute. So, you know, I'll thank you before the event as well as those that came this morning. Again, our poster presenters and our exhibitors, thank you very much for, for, for um, bringing those along today. And then um, the big ass pictures this, today. I thought it was quite an interesting listening to some of those. So thanks again for coming along. Um, so finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Midlands Engine, um, for, for um, helping us and sponsoring this event today, and to Medilink for supporting it so well. So my final job, really, is to introduce the final sessions. And as this morning, we have three sessions going on at the same time. There will be some refreshments served at the back of the room, so feel free to grab a drink while you um, are in, in those sessions. So taking place in this room is the strength sessions, and then taking place in the Balacrane room is the ambition sessions, and then the Bracebridge room is the translation sessions. So your programme tells you what's in all of those. I, I don't want to waste um, the, the time for the presenters going through that. So thanks very much for everyone attending. And please go in and join our next sessions because, you know, there, there's going to be some great stuff in there. Thank you very much. <laughs>